After more than 50 years and 24 films, the James Bond franchise is inarguably the most successful and steadfast in film history. Based on a canon of novels by journalist and World War II intelligence officer Ian Fleming, Bond was already a household name in the United Kingdom a decade before reaching the silver screen. But it was Sean Connery's performance as a souped up version of Fleming's iconic super spy that turned 007 into one of the UK's largest cultural exports on par with Doctor Who and the Beatles. Bond films became style and design forecasts, dictating everything from fashion and gadgetry to preferences on interior design, drinks, cars and firearms around the world. And it's with this lens, Bond as a design icon, that we look to the franchise for cues on aspects of dynamic media design. So in these lectures, we'll overlook the sexist, classist and often racist overtones of the Bond world and focus on the thin veneer of two famous visual Bond hallmarks, not of Ian Fleming's origin. These are the Bond barrel sequence in which white dots animate in stop frame fashion across the screen to become a gun barrel aimed at 007, and the main title sequence, a sovereign piece of graphic real estate nestled into every Bond film, usually around 15 minutes into the first act, at the conclusion of the traditional pre-title action sequence. In broad terms, Bond sequences can be defined as a strong visual statement accompanied by a high-profile pop ballad both bordering on total excess. Technology for art's sake has also played an important role over the years. And in some cases, it's evidenced in the construction from optical film compositing, in-camera effects and stop-frame animation in the 1960s to experimental CGI and digital compositing, motion capture and motion control in recent years, and likely an untold number of late-night innovations throughout. But technology has also found its way to the foreground and as an aesthetic in the Bond title sequences. Lasers, projections, science-grade high-speed and close-up photography, and an array of optical tricks have all made prominent cameos over the years. It's been the role of the sequence's main directors, Morris Binder, Robert Brownjohn and Daniel Kleinman, to balance these concerns with their own interpretation of the film and the Bond legacy and to shepherd the tradition intact through successive eras. I'd also point you to the odd man out here, MK12's sole title sequence for the Bond series with Quantum of Solace in 2008, which seems out of place with the other sequences and so we kind of make short shrift of it in this lecture. These three main designers, Binder, Brown, John and Kleinman, also provide a bridge for us that spans changing motion graphic considerations over three decades. So in a way, the Bond films are a great mirror to broader shifts in the world of dynamic media design. Just as the Bond films have had a significant impact on culture at large over the years, so too have their title sequences affected the landscape of graphic and title design in the latter half of the century and onwards, due in equal measure to the creative and technical contributions of its directors and a savvy and supportive production backbone willing to take box office risks to protect their integrity. American title designer Morris Binder was the first designer of the James Bond title sequences. Beginning with Dr. No in 1962 and ending with License to Kill in 1989, Binder's stylish credit sequences for 14 of the 007 films have become a trademark of the series. Binder's reputation as a commercial artist was well established prior to coming to the Bond franchise. His career began as an art director at Columbia Pictures in Los Angeles during World War II, before he moved to New York in the 1950s as the advertising director for Macy's, then to Swinging London in the 1960s where he designed titles for Stanley Donan films. Binder was approached by Bond producers Harry Saltzman and Cubby Broccoli after they saw his titles for Donan's film The Grass is Greener. Binder's trajectory of movement from West Coast America in the 1940s to New York in the 1950s to swing in London in the 1960s is paralleled by a number of other influential designers of the time, such as Pablo Ferro. And we can see in this there's an historical indication of the shifting nexus of design innovation from LA to New York to, to London. The classic gun barrel opening that precedes the traditional pre-credit opening sequences in every 007 film was initially created by Binder for the opening to Dr. No. Gunshots, which are fired across the screen, transform onto the barrel of a gun that follows the motion of the silhouetted figure of Bond. The figure turns towards the camera and fires, and as a red blood-like kind of substance flows down from the top of the screen, the gun barrel becomes reduced to a white dot. Binder achieved this effect by actually photographing through the barrel of a 38 revolver. 
And this much imitated and parodied sequence is a trademark of the 007 series and still used extensively throughout its promotion. Each actor who plays Bond has their own interpretation of the famous gun barrel walk-on. For Binder's first title sequence for Bond, the idea of using graphic dots to represent the barrel of a gun famously came from Binder assembling a presentation using white price tag stickers only minutes before meeting with the producers. Binder says it was something that he did just in a hurry, off the cuff, and he just happened to have these little white price tag stickers and thought he could use them as gunshots across the screen. James Bond walks through, fires, the blood comes down on the screen, and what began as a short vignette that was just meant to introduce the Bond character was then expanded into a full title sequence. All of the elements were shot on black and white film and the negatives were then hand coloured and re-photographed along with the title plates to create the final composite with Binder's stickers, these little white price tag stickers, becoming the centrepiece of one of the most beloved and best known title sequences in, in film history. And while the dots can be appreciated as a purely visceral design statement, their connection to the barrel sequence endows them with greater meaning. Each dot in the Doctor No title sequence becoming a bullet either intended for or delivered by 007. Robert Brownjohn took over title duties on the next two Bond films from Russia with Love in 1963 and Goldfinger in 1964. And we're looking at from Russia with Love. Like Binder, Brownjohn was an American migrant to London in the early 1960s. Brownjohn, like Saul Bass, was a student of uh, the Bauhaus luminaries, but he trained directly with Laszlo Mohli-Nahi at the Institute of Design in Chicago, where he was studying in the 1940s. A long-time advocate and practitioner of experimental typography, Brownjohn believed that thoughtful and provocative type compositions could resound as well as any image or work of art. In From Russia With Love, Brownjohn projects the film titles directly onto the body of a backlit belly dancer. The title cards themselves are static, inheriting their motion from the gyrations of the dancer. Brownjohn said his inspiration for the sequence came from watching students walk across the path of a projector during a lecture that he gave. Brownjohn, who hated storyboards and scripts, pitched the concept to the producers by taking off his own shirt and standing in front of a slide projector. And he said, it'll be just like this, except we'll use a pretty girl. In Goldfinger from 1964, Brownjohn further evolved his techniques this time projecting footage from the film directly onto actress Margaret Nolan, who was painted gold from head to toe. Brown John's projected film is matched to the curves of the actress Nolan. Brown John's using the female form as a double landscape on which to graft and recontextualize the projected images. So knees become hills that Bond must traverse. Nolan's body is a runway for a plane. The grill of Bond's Aston Martin masks her face. Her lips are replaced by the ever-switching decoy license plate of the Aston Martin. And the length of torso is a road along which cars race. Oh. Morris Binder returned to the franchise in 1965 to direct the titles to Thunderball, which featured several sequence firsts. The use of optical compositing techniques in which elements filmed separately are then combined by layering the negatives together, and the use of kinetic typography with the title cards rippling on and off. And because it would happen eventually, the first appearance of full nudes in a Bond film. Binder adopted Brown John's burlesque silhouettes and made them even more provocative while contextualizing them in the same modernist aesthetic that he first applied to Dr. No, integrating them into minimal compositions with bold colors and clean, justified typesetting. If there are a point of origin for the Bond title sequence, it would be Thunderball. And this is due not only to its abundant silhouettes and thematic backdrops, but also to its compositions and assembly, creating a self-contained graphic world that bestows the sequence with the dreamlike quality common to all Bond title sequences to follow. 
Binder also introduces a narrative thread and the element of danger in the form of divers pursuing their female counterparts, giving the sequence greater relevance to the film that would follow. And while both he and Brown John had previously incorporated thematic elements into their sequences, Thunderball was the first to holistically embrace the theme as its premise, with water seeping into every nuance of its design. Binder's sequence for You Only Live Twice from 1967 further evolves his experiments with optical compositing, this time creating windows from silhouettes through which other imagery is seen. Its composites are sophisticated and fluid, often blending together several animated elements at once. He also integrates partially lit subjects and photographic backgrounds for the first time, creating palettes and compositions which are almost certainly influenced by the exotica movement of the 1960s that's typified in the tropical album covers of Arthur Lyman and Martin Denny. One for your dreams. So to leap through a few key Binder titles and to get a sense of how the sequences evolved over time, we'll look next at Live and Let Die from 1973 perhaps Binder's boldest sequence and still the most aggressive entry in the franchise, mixing blatant nudity and dramatic lighting with plenty of fire seen mostly through the eyes of a burning skull. Hard edits and crowded compositions work in concert with Paul McCartney's iconic theme song, matching its frantic pacing at the onset with fast action set against red and oranges, and then cooling to a palette of blue sparks and smoke as the track slows and returning again to warmer hues as the sequence closes in the hands of a woman. Binder employs a similar yet more refined type animation technique as he did in Thunderball, warping the text as though seen through water. Binder met head-on with the mid-1980s in the sequence for A View to a Kill in 1985. He matches Duran Duran's high-energy pop theme with an equally loud palette of neon paint applied to guns and women and filmed under blacklight. Binder's trademark silhouettes are present but subdued, taking a back seat to cross-dissolved vignettes of fire, ice and neon psychedelia. Ever the tongue-in-cheek provocateur, Binder opens the sequence with a woman unzipping her jacket to reveal a hidden 007 logo painted between her breasts, with Ian Fleming's James Bond superimposed, a composition as iconic and as relevant as any of his best efforts. Binder, who once summarised his Bond titles as girls, guns, smoke and steam, would often inject microtrends into his sequences. These are recurring elements that would find their way into several of his titles and then vanish. Silhouetted hands to introduce or close the sequence, images and type distorted through water, close-ups of eyes, the official 007 logo as key art, and also recycling iconic footage. Binder's final Bond entry, Licence to Kill from 1989, is the most sophisticated of his sequences in terms of a technical standpoint. He returns again to many of his favourite themes, but with a much cleaner and more refined execution. This is certainly due in part to rapid advancements in film technology at the end of the, of the 1980s, along with non-linear editing and digital compositing that were fast replacing the analogue solutions Binder had mastered over his 23 tenure with the franchise. Ironically, only at the advent of the uh, digital age did it become apparent that many themes frequented by, by Binder, his silhouettes, his image composites, the creative titling, these were ideas that were several decades ahead of the technological means. And while girls, guns, smoke and steam may be the things for which he's best remembered, it's perhaps his ability to understand both his audience and his material and deliver to both with consistency and novelty that is the reason that his popularity has endured. Binder died in 1991, just two years after Licence to Kill, and many critics argued so did the Bond franchise, for a while at least. <laughs>